Um, we left off yesterday uh, with this, okay? And uh, I was talking about uh, the annexation of Austria. Um, quick story, okay? Uh, you guys have probably all driven through Eastboro over on the east side by the mall and know that Eastboro, it's its own little town inside the city of Wichita. So kind of the, the backstory on that is, is Wichita expanded. Uh, it used to be smaller, you know, and it spread east and west. Um, it was the 1950s. The mayor of Eastboro uh, and the mayor of Wichita did not get along. And so as Wichita tried to annex Eastboro, <laughs> They said, no, we're not joining. Okay, so if you drive through there, you know, it's one way, 20 miles an hour. Okay, there's one cop. So if you see him on the other side and you pass him, you're free to go. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, so they would be protected by the uh, Sedgwick County Fire Department rather than the Wichita Fire Department, if that makes sense. Okay, so, and the Sheriff's Department could help them as well if they had any major crimes or anything like that. So, um, that's what basically means by annexation. And um, so yesterday, hopefully you watched the video and we talked about um, this German blood, okay? And so that takes us into the next slide, okay? And the next target is that region of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland. So we are up here, okay? Now this land was taken from Germany uh, for from the Treaty of Versailles, okay? And Hitler wanted it back. All right, and there's a couple important things here. Well, there's a lot of important things here. That guy's got a really bushy eyebrow. Well, this, yeah, this is Neville Chamberlain. No, 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 the one on the other side. This one? No. No. Over here. No, 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 far left, far, far left. Yeah, that's Neville Chamberlain. Oh, okay. Same guy here and there. Okay, yeah. That's the British Prime Minister, okay? And I introduced you to him yesterday um as when roosevelt asked for um thank you when roosevelt asked for uh the countries to disarm uh in the name of economic security okay so the czechs they're ready to fight okay um they're ready to mobilize for war and they're thinking that if Germany invades Czechoslovakia, they're gonna get help from the British and the French, okay? And maybe even Russia, all right? So let, let me kind of go back to something that I've talked about in the past in, in dealing with Russia, okay? So Czechoslovakia is here in Central Europe, okay? And I know you guys on the map, I need to pull out from you guys. Um, the map had Czech and Czech Republic, right? Or Czech Republic and Slovakia, or the map you had just had Czechoslovakia. So that's what it was in World War One. Today it's split up, obviously, into two countries. But guys, anytime something happens in Central or Southern Europe here, it usually raises the ire of Russia. Okay, so the Czechs were thinking. You know, the Russians are helping in the Spanish Civil War. Maybe the Russians will step up and help in Slovakia and Czechoslovakia. And they're also the only real democracy in Central Europe. And so they're thinking, hey, they're going to help us, right? Now, the Alps provide a natural barrier here defensive barrier for the Czechs. So if, if they invade, the Germans are going to have to come across the Elbe, which is going to be difficult. Okay. So Chamberlain and the French premier, a guy named Dallivier, are going to try and prevent war from breaking out in Europe. So they're going to help the Czechs, just not in the way the Czechs wanted. And this becomes known as the Munich Pact. Okay, so you're going to have these four men meeting in Munich in September of 1938. Neville Chamberlain, British Prime Minister, Premier Dallier of France, Hitler, and Mussolini. These four men are in a room, 
and they're discussing the fate of Czechoslovakia. Who is not in the room? Czechoslovakia is not in the room. The Czech president is literally in the hallway, knowing that France and Britain are about to throw them under the bus and give Hitler back the Sudeten in the preservation of peace. Because the Czechs were mobilizing. They were ready to fight. They were going to stand up to Hitler. But Chamberlain and Dallivier, now the Czechs call this the Munich betrayal. History calls this the Munich Pact, okay? Because the Czechs are going to get betrayed. Now, from what I've read about this, Russia wanted to help. But the Poles said no. What the heck is going on here? Wait, why did the Poles have a say in what wanted to do? Because they would have to come through Poland. So, like, when we went to Afghanistan, we had to, like, talk to uh, Saudi Arabia. Well, um, to the north, to the uh, Kazakhstan, okay, in order to get troops in through there, okay. Um, you know, place to land planes and stuff like that, supplies. Yeah, Iraq war, definitely Saudi Arabia, okay. So, uh, this becomes known as the Munich Pact, all right. So, by attempting to appease Hitler, they will dismember Czechoslovakia and give him the Sudeten. There's, remember, three million people of German ancestry living in the Sudeten, okay? Chamberlain gets Hitler to sign a, a, a letter. He's holding it up right here. Chamberlain returns from Munich. He's standing on the tarmac in London. And he's holding a press conference. News cameras are there. Everybody's there. What, what happened in Munich? And Chamberlain gives this speech. He says, this piece of paper bears my name as well as the name of Herr Hitler. That he will seek no new territorial gains in Europe. We have peace in our time. And the crowd erupts in applause. They've just sold out the Czechs. Now, in this region of Czechoslovakia, okay, so if I just kind of draw Czechoslovakia, and you got Germany here, okay, so this is the region of the Sudeten. Follow me? We're all getting better at our geography now, okay? Now, inside here, of course, you have the Alps here, okay, the mountains, but inside here, is something called the Skoda Works. See, the Czechs were ready to fight because the Skoda Works is the second largest munitions factory in Europe behind Germany's munitions factory. The Czechs are ready for war. But with the Alps out of the way and no support from Russia, no support from Britain or France. They're doomed. So Hitler gets the Sudeten. How long will it take for Hitler, after he puts his troops in the Sudeten, takes the Skoda? How long will it take for him to just go ahead and march in and take the rest of Czechoslovakia? Well, the answer to that question is six months. But, but Hitler signed the piece of paper, right? No new territorial gains, right? This is probably the single greatest example of appeasement leading up to World War II, okay? And we've talked about several, okay? So um, it'll be March of 1939 when he marches, and the Czechs will not fight. Okay. Without the Alps, 
and the Germans being able to bring all their troops in. Um, this is back. Okay. We didn't know this at the time. Okay. But if Britain and France would have resisted Hitler on Czechoslovakia, uh, there were German generals that were planning to remove him. And Hitler has now taken over two countries without firing a shot. You know what I mean? He hasn't had to fire a shot. Right? He is riding hot. Okay. So this appeasement, when we talk about the bully, right, you don't stand up to him. He's going to gain power. All right. So I have a video. And I kind of mentioned this yesterday, and I had two videos. So I showed the, uh, you know, the taking over of uh, Austria yesterday. I want to show this video here, which um, brings up this idea of appeasement in the modern world today. Okay. A big power in Timothy. It's kind of a serious video, but it's very thoughtful. Um, so let's watch this, okay? That's the volume. And if it's neighbors, a crisis erupts. World leaders need to head off war. Ideally struck and peace is proclaimed. But rather than determining aggression, the deal inadvertently promotes it. Within a year, the world is at war. I'm Jim Lindsay, and this is History Lesson. Our topic today is the Munich Agreement, which was signed by the leaders of Germany, Italy, Britain, and France in the early morning hours of September 30th, 1938. The backdrop to the Munich Agreement is Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany's remilitarization. Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany in 1933. A year later, he made himself a dictator or Fuhrer and ushered in the Third Reich. Hitler moved aggressively to jumpstart a foundering German economy and to jettison the constraints that had been imposed on the German military after World War I. European leaders nervously looked the other way as he ran Russia on over the security provisions of the Treaty of Versailles and reasserted German power in Central Europe. One goal of Hitler's policies was to create Lebensraum, or a greater living space for Germany. The belief that Germany needed expanded borders included the idea that ethnic Germans living in neighboring countries should come under German rule. In March 1938, Germany absorbed Austria in the Anschluss. Hitler then turned his attention to the Sudetenland, those parts of Czechoslovakia where some three million ethnic Germans predominate. Hitler grew increasingly hostile to Czechoslovakia over the course of the summer of 1938. In mid-September, he gave a fiery anti-Czech speech, raising fears that war was imminent. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain responded by rushing to Germany for talks to keep the continent at peace. Chamberlain approached his talks with Hitler, mindful of how the First World War had laid waste to a generation of Europeans and worried that new technologies like the airplane would make the next war even more horrific. He also worried that the British military was still prepared to fight Germany and that the British public wanted peace, not war. So without consulting Czechoslovakian leaders, Chamberlain agreed to Hitler's demand that Germany absorb the Sudetenland. Chamberlain then persuaded the Czechoslovakian and French government to accept his concession. The details were worked out in two subsequent sets of meetings. The Czechoslovakian government was pointedly not invited to concluding talks at Munich that finalized the country's dismemberment. On October 1st, 1938, Czechoslovakian frontier guards left their post and German troops moved into the Sudetenland. The day before, Chamberlain had flown back to London where he was met by cheering crowds. He waved a memo Hitler had signed pledging Germany's peaceful intentions and told the crowd that he had brought peace for our time. This morning, I had Another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Oh, 
Some of you perhaps have already heard what it contains. So I would just like to read it to you. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Not all of Chamberlain's fellow Britons believed that he had saved the day. Winston Churchill's response to what Chamberlain had brought at Munich was with him. You were given the choice between war and dishonor. You chose dishonor, and you will have war. As you all know, Churchill was right. Eleven months after the Munich Agreement was signed with Shields, German troops invaded Poland. The Second World War had begun. The terms Munich and appeasement entered the diplomatic hall of the What is the lesson of the Munich Agreement? Just this. Appeasing the adversary's demands may diffuse a crisis, but it can also increase the chances of war by emboldening that adversary to demand more. Chamberlain thought that if Germany gained the Sudetenland, land, that Hitler would finally be satisfied with the status quo in Europe. But Hitler instead viewed Munich as confirming his belief that Britain and France both lacked the will to stop German expansion. It is worth remembering the Munich Agreement as we survey potential threats around the globe today. China is a growing military power that is challenging the territorial claim of its neighbors in Northeast and Southeast Asia. Iran seeks to become a nuclear power, a development that could upend the geopolitical order in the Middle East. In these and other instances, the United States must weigh the risk that diplomacy and compromise will signal weakness and invite war against the risk that standing firm will poison relations and trigger conflicts that could have been avoided. Unfortunately, which of these risks is greater is usually far clearer when looking backward in history than when looking forward into the future. So here's a question to consider. On what issue or conflict is the United States most likely to repeat Neville Chamberlain's mistake? I encourage you to weigh in with your answers on my blog, The Water's Edge. You can find it at CFR.org. Okay. So it, it does propose a, an interesting question there. Uh, if you look at China today uh, and Iran, um, who are potential foes, and Russia for that matter. Uh, now, with Russia, guys, after, after World War II, you know, we established NATO that we'll talk about in here as a defensive alliance against Soviet expansion. Okay, and then we fought in Korea and Vietnam to stop that expansion of communism. Um, with with China, it's it's a very interesting situation and one that will probably be dealt with in your lifetime, guys. Um, I, I know in in, in uh, government class we talked about defending Taiwan uh, early on. I know that was a long time ago, uh, but it's. Uh, China is growing, and um, strategically, um, they want to position themselves against the United States. And I think we have to learn from history here that um, if they start to make some moves, we either need to stand up, or if we don't, who will? Okay. And the natural ally of China is Iran and the Soviet Union. Okay, so... Um, Potentially, the world could see some really bad things happen. And I think without the United States, and if we do not project strength against that, then they will perceive that as weakness. Okay, And the Russians have always been like that. They seize on weakness. Okay, uh, And that's where, you know, you, you go back to the 1980s and you look at Ronald Reagan, who projected enormous amounts of strength. Now, people said he's going to get us into a third world war, a nuclear war, but that never happened because of that projection of strength, okay? So, guys, I mean, we really control uh, the fate, I think, foreign policy-wise of the world, the United States does, and whether we're going to stand up to aggressor nations or not. And these are the lessons we really learned between World War I and World War II. And we're going to behave far differently after World War II than we do after World War I. Okay, all this isolationism stuff after World War II, nope. We're in it. You know what I mean? We are engaging the world and promoting our ideas over those of our foes like communism. 
Okay. So um, this is a really important um, topic um, to, to study in history. All right. So I know that that was a little bit dry. And if you noticed, um, the man in the video only blinked once. <laughs> he is a scary dude. Like, his eyes are sunken in. I read the comments on YouTube. It's like, I think that dude was looking through. In his mouth. Did you see the way, if you look, the corners of his mouth, like, curl in. They look like tonsils. It's so weird. Did you see that? No. Oh, my God. Look at it again. Like, the way I he talks. I did. Yeah. All right. So, this is a good map uh, showing um, what's going on here, okay? And, and really shows you uh, more detail uh, of the Sudetenland area, okay? So, what this does, this is September 30th, 1938. And then this is Czech territory given to Hungary by Germany down here. Uh, and then that's uh, October, just a few days later. And then November 1st, this little part right here is annexed by Poland. All right, so um, guys, this is uh, this is devastating for the Czechs, okay? And like I said, six months later, Hitler will be in position to just march right in, okay? Um, all right, so I have some political cartoons here. Uh, this is Dr. Seuss. He did a lot, actually, in World War II. Uh, we haven't canceled him totally yet from history, okay? you haven't heard about the Dr. Seuss books. Okay. And the estate of Dr. Seuss has now stopped printing some of the books. Okay. All right. So, the, and on this platform, the most amazing marvel of the age, he lives, he talks, yet he has no guts. He is the appeasement. Okay. This is a modern day appeasement. So, you have uh, this guy here with a bone for the rabid terror dog thing okay good boy see i give doggy a nice bone he goes away okay so playing nice with these people doesn't generally work okay? and then uh, maybe i'll play this uh, creepy nazi octopus monster thing a song and he'll be nice to me this one's a little harsh okay but hey uh, depending on how you feel about the media, all right? So if uh, if the media were reporting on D-Day, which when we were liberating France uh, of Nazis, okay, this is maybe one way they would say it today. So, By invading here at Normandy, the Allies are collectively punishing the French for the Nazi, the Nazi occupation of their country. And then this one here, um, now obviously we'll talk about this later on, okay? Uh, and, you know, the contra controversy over uh, the United States using the atomic bomb. But um, this is definitely what you would more likely see today than what you saw in 1945 from the media. Okay. Just a little dig there. Okay. So let's continue. Uh, what's happening next? All right. Remember where Albania is on your map? It's number 25. On your map. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and get those out because I, I want to remember to collect those. Okay. This right here, right across from the uh, the heel of Italy. Okay. This is the uh, Adriatic Sea, right here, which I believe did I have that on there? Adriatic Sea. Yeah. Twenty six. Yeah. 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 So right across the, uh, the heel of Italy is Albania. And so on April 7, 1939, uh, Italy invades, okay? And then Britain, Neville Chamberlain, steps up and says, look, if Poland, Greece, or Romania are attacked by the Germans, we will go to war, okay? And the French will join in in, in this statement, okay? So, um, finally, right, now let's bring Roosevelt back into this, all right? It's about this time he sends a letter to Adolf Hitler, the President of the United States, and he sends him a list of 31 nations, and he, these are, you know, European nations, and um, 
African nations, and, and, and so forth. And uh, he asked Hitler not to invade them for 10 years. Yeah, this kind of takes you back to the Tidings McDuffie Act, where we said, told the world that, hey, we're going to leave the Philippines in 12 years. Yeah, that was 1934. All right, so, guys, Hitler reads this letter, and you can look it up on YouTube. He reads this letter from Roosevelt in front of the Reichstag, a bunch of his Nazi stooges, okay? And um, they're laughing it up at the expense of the President of the United States. <coughs> Hitler is saying, we want no checks, we want no poles, we want no Brits. You know, he's going through this list, okay, which is obviously a lie, okay, but this really kind of ticks off Roosevelt. You know what I mean? He's being ridiculed here. And so um, Hitler knows they're not ready for war. He's already seen it. He's been appeased by that. He's pushed all the buttons, and nobody's responded. Okay, so Roosevelt asked Congress to repeal the arms embargo. At this point, guys, we're allowed to send guns, but no bullets, planes, no bombs, ships, no shells, or anything like that, torpedoes or anything like that. Okay, so Congress says no. Again, very isolationist. This is a picture of the German Reichstag, by the way. Okay. Is it burning? That's, that was, yeah, that's the picture of it burning. Um, and now this could be at the end of World War II when the Soviets go into Berlin, or it could be the situation where uh, Hitler seized power. I'm not sure. All right, so we're not getting involved, and uh, Roosevelt's, you know, Doing his thing. It's political. Okay. Uh, continuing problems with Japan. Now, what Congress does do, by 1939, it allows the president to end its commercial treaty with Japan. Now, whenever they deem necessary. They're not doing it yet. Okay. So, freeze Congress to stop the sale of war materials to Japan. We will not yet. Okay. Japan had been attacking China with weapons bought from the United States um, and also using the most important export we have to Japan for them is oil, fuel, gasoline, okay? Um, we are a very large exporter of oil at this point to Japan and still are to this day. We export a lot of oil to Japan and a lot of that comes out of Alaska and they put it on cargo ships and they send it down to Japan. Okay. Um, even though, guys, pretty much we're energy independent in, the, in, the, in this hemisphere, um, we still take in oil from the Middle East. It's just it's how it best logistically works. Okay. Um, so, things are getting closer here uh, in our relationship with Japan. Eventually, we will cut off trade. Okay, but not yet. All right. So what's next? Let's see. Oh yeah. Don't worry about that last line. It's right here. Okay. All right. So then the world is shocked to hear about a pact between the Soviet Union and Germany, Nazi Germany. So Hitler and Stalin are going to get together and sign the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, okay, which is another name for it. It's a non-aggression pact, okay, or the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop. Okay, so in this picture here, you got Uncle Joe, Stalin, okay. This is uh, the foreign, Soviet foreign minister, uh, Silichev, Silosov, Slav. Molotov. You guys know what a Molotov cocktail is? Claire? No? So you've probably seen it before. It's like you take a bottle of wine and you fill it up with gasoline and you put a rag in there or something and then you light it and then you throw the bottle. It's like a fireball. 
to the Molotov cocktail. I'm not sure if it was named after this guy or not. Okay. Wouldn't surprise me. But anyhow, uh, this is the uh, German general uh, Ribbentrop, okay, uh, Hitler's top general at the time. Okay. So this is interesting. Now, who has Hitler said is an enemy of the Soviets all this time? An enemy of the Soviets all this time. The communists. He hates the communists. He's been since 1933. And now we're in a non aggressive Got to make people scratch their head. What's going on? Okay. And what this, the plan, the secret part of the plan that people don't hear about is this one, is to split Poland, okay, and create a buffer between each other, okay? So they both agree to invade Poland, the secret part of the pact. All right, now, remember, Britain and France have said they will go to war if Poland is invaded. Now, are Britain and France sending troops into Poland at this point? No, they're not, okay? The Poles are on their own, all right? And um, this is going to be ugly, actually, okay? Um, so, in, also in this agreement, uh, the Soviets are going to get the eastern part of Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Okay, those are the three nations that uh, border the Baltic Sea up here. Okay, right up here. Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Just south of Finland, okay, are these three countries here. Yeah. How would it be a buffer? Um... Well, they could get their troops in there. You know what I mean? So, like, for the Russians, it's a buffer because they can move their defenses further out towards Hitler. And Hitler can... You know, but Czechoslovakia is Hitler occupied. Czechoslovakia. Yeah, he's he's already got that right. So there's no buffer between that. No. Yeah. <laughs> and you you've got to try and get in Stalin's head at this point, right? And think, what the heck is this guy thinking? First of all, I think he's trying to buy time. Okay, because the Soviets are trying to rearm. And one of the smart things Stalin actually does here. If, if you look at Russia, what he's going to start to do, knowing that Hitler's going to invade at some point, it's in his book, right? Hitler's, he's telegraphed all this. Okay, so what Stop, Stalin's going to do is he's going to move a lot of his manufacturing out here past the Ural Mountains. Okay, out of the reach of German bombers. All right, so they're splitting Poland here, Okay. And he's moving his manufacturing out here. This is going to allow the Soviets to one day bounce back. Because right now, their military is no match for the Germans, if that makes sense. Okay. This thing keeps, oh, my thing's over there. Okay. Sorry, guys. Let me show you that real quick, because I just showed everybody else. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so. You're going to split Poland here, and then he, well, Stalin's going to move his manufacturing out here. Okay. So, um, and we will talk about uh, what's, what's known as Operation Barbarossa, which is when the Soviets do invade, uh, or excuse me, the, the Germans do invade the Soviet Union. Okay, That's a huge part of this war. All right, so, let's have to get out of here. 25, okay. It's, it's really at this point, guys, I'd like to kind of stop and tell a story, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, because really, this is the beginning of World War II, is the invasion of Poland. Okay. That's when Britain and France will declare war and World War II officially begins. And that'll be in September uh, of 1939. Okay. So I want to tell a story. And, you know, I've kind of. Uh, glossed over what's happening with the Jews at this point, uh, with the Holocaust and so forth. But I want to talk about this town. Okay, there's a town that's just north of Warsaw, which is the capital of Poland, of course, right? All right, and it's a small town, and I'm just going to draw Poland here. Okay, uh, Warsaw is kind of central. Okay. And eventually, 
the country's going to look like this. I know this is, this is the Ribbentrop Molotov line here, okay, but eventually it'll be more like this, okay. So on September 1st, okay, so pre 9 139, the, the, uh, the uh, Germans invade, okay, Poland. And two weeks later, um, the Soviets will invade, okay. So the Poles are going to fight. And <clears throat> now most of their aircraft are World War I, like, biplanes. And by this time, the Germans have monoplanes, mono, mono wing planes, single wing planes, that are fast, agile, and their pilots already have experience from flying in the, in the Spanish Civil War, okay? The, uh, the Poles are actually still using horseback cavalry, okay? They do have some tanks from World War I and so forth. They're going to fight. So 90% of the Polish forces are going to be on the, on the Western Front. Their flank, the Eastern Front, when the Soviets come, is going to be barely defended. You follow me? So even though the German war machine, which we'll refer to as their warfare, is blitzkrieg, and I'll get into that when we return on Monday, okay? But um, even though that's overwhelming, it does take a little bit of time for the Germans to push towards Warsaw, okay? Because almost the whole Polish army is here. This one, on this side, the, the Russians are going to move faster, okay? And there's a little town to the north of Warsaw called Genwabe, all right? Now, this is an interesting town. There's roughly about 3,000 people in this town. And what's unique about it is that about half of its population is Jewish, and the other half of its population is Polish or Catholic. Okay, you follow me here? All right. So what happened in this town was not really known publicly until after the Cold War in 1990. And they opened the Soviet archives after the Soviet Union collapsed. And researchers were able to go and look at different things. And this researcher went in and found a court case that the Soviets had performed about what happened in this small town in 1939. And what they found was shocking. What happened was, this was supposed to be occupied by the Nazis, okay? But the Soviets showed up in this small town first. They beat the Nazis there. They went too far. So if you, do you think in 1939, September 39, if you were Jewish living in Poland, do you think you had heard of what was happening to Jews in Germany? So when the not when you heard about the Nazi invasion, were you nervous? Were you scared? Absolutely, and you should be. Okay? So when the Soviets showed up in this small town, guys, the Jews were very relieved. And they were very accommodating as well to these communists. They're like, oh, thank goodness it's you guys. Can we do anything while you're here? Uh, do you need help with anything? Well, the Poles in that town were like, why are these Jews being so nice to these communists that just invaded our country? You follow me? And they're like, I don't like this. Then the Soviets, they realized they had gone too far and they left. A few days later, the German infantry starts showing up in this town. And the Poles in this town were like, well, let's try and make them happy so they don't kill us. And we know they don't like Jews, so let's like try and help them with the Jews. And so there were a few people that started like taking advantage of the situation and robbing Jewish homes and beating up Jews and so forth. And, and actually, a couple were killed by civilians. And the town leaders got together and said, well, we need to, like, we need to fix this. We need to cover this up or whatever. So they go to the German infantry, and they're like, hey, do you want us to help you with these Jews? 
Now, this is the thing about the Germans, guys. When they send in their infantry, these people don't deal with the Jews. There's groups that come in after the infantry. The job of the infantry is to find the enemy soldiers and take them out, not round up Jews. There's a group called the Eitzengruppe that would come in after the infantry and deal with the Jewish problem. And so these infantry guys are like, no, we don't need any help, just go away. But they were persistent. So the town leaders trying to cover up a couple of murders and robberies and so forth that had taken place. You guys, Jewish families are like running. They're trying to flee the town, okay? Running into the woods or the fields. And they're like, no, we got to keep these people here. So the town leaders started rounding up the Jews. And they brought them all to town square. So there's about 1,500 Jews there. By this time, there's about 1,200 Jews that got assembled in this town center. And they're talking to the Germans, and they're saying, what do you want us to do with it? And they're like, we don't want you to do anything with it. And so to cover, I mean, because, guys, they're guilty of, like, really mistreating their neighbors here. Okay. So they decide to put them in a barn, a large barn off the town square. Lock the doors. 1,200 Jews inside. And to cover their tracks, they decided to burn them, killing 1,200 Jews, their neighbors. These are the people that they'd gone to school with, they worked with, like they knew each other. This is a small town. So we never heard about this story. This researcher goes in, the Soviets, once they took over Poland, after the war, they put people on trial for this mass murder. The Soviets did. We just never heard about it. Okay, and so they had the transcripts of the trial and witnesses, some that survived, a few Jews that survived. Okay, not the fire, but had escaped and then found out what happened. And uh, they convicted several poles of this murder. Okay, um, murders. And it's a, it's a really sad story. And it, it's in a book called Neighbors uh, that was published back in the late 90s. So the, 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 pur the purpose the author says here is, you know, this can only happen like in a, a war. You know what I mean? War allows for tragedies like this to take place. We should try and avoid that. All right. You guys have a great break. And... Um, We'll see you on the back side, on the flip side.